Dear Mr. Colfax, I read on a forum about the person that you've been looking for. I think I might know where he's hiding. I think he's in Ruggles Mine, which is uh, out in Grafton. It's got tunnels and underground chambers that were closed to the public a few years ago. I don't have any pictures of him, but I think I have seen him twice, at night both times. It makes sense that he would try to hide in there. You need to go check it out. I've drawn a map of where I saw him and enclosed it. Sincerely, John B. Price <clears throat> Okay, I just want to make sure the slide count is correct here before I start. All right, uh, just let me know if the lights are too high um, and there's not enough contrast on the screen. Hello, my name is Charles Colfax. Uh, before I tell you my own story, it's very important that I tell you someone else's. This is something that happened in 1921 in Andeston, New Hampshire. Andeston was and still is a farm town, very small. The pastor of Union Protestant Church in Andeston in 1921 was a man named Franz Lergo, a German immigrant. Uh, on the screen now is a picture from the Andeston Call announcing his appointment to Union Protestant in 1916. One day, uh, Father Lergo was visited after Sunday services by a local couple in their 50s, Roy and Rhoda Blass. They owned a carpet store. They had a strange story to tell him. When they were out walking near the southwestern edge of Squam Lake near their property, on the morning before in a light snowfall, they'd come across a boy of about 12 or 13 lying on the shore of the lake, half in and half out of the water, not breathing very well. And he had no clothes on. He was barely responsive. Roy pulled him forcibly out of the creek, and he saw that the boy had a broken left foot. But the immediate problem had been that he might die from hypothermia. Mr. Blass was 66 at the time, but he managed to carry the boy half a mile back to their house, stopping and starting. And they got him warmed up, and a medic came to the house with the local GP, who was able to set the foot on the spot, and they left the boy in the Blass's care. Over the next two days, they weren't able to find out anything about who the boy was, who his parents were. And here we see on the screen uh, that particular entry in Father Lergo's diary with a translation from German. He kept this diary off and on until he passed away. The Blasses had come to him for some advice on what to do next. And here we see what Father Lergo wrote about that. It's just part of his, his day plan. Tomorrow, 10, Blass House. Ask M for address. Need more information about the boy. And you see the date on this entry is here, November 8, 1921. On November 9th, he drove out to the Blass's property and he met with the couple and they took him upstairs to meet the boy. The night before, the boy had tried to leave. He tried to hobble out, but he wasn't able to get very far at all with a broken foot. He was totally unresponsive to whatever language was tried on him. English, German, even a little French. He also seemed very resistant to wearing clothes of any kind. Father Lergo wrote about his impression that the boy seemed to appreciate being warmed by them, but uh, he would only really accept blankets being laid over him. There's a particular sentence he wrote, which is highlighted on this slide, translated from German. It says... <clears throat> Something unusual about the bone structure around the eyes. The orbits are shaped differently. A more perfect circular shape than an ordinary person. It bothered me. And in the margins, he made this amateur sketch of those eyes as if you were trying to remember this detail and, and set it down. Father Lergo left the couple around noon. It was his recommendation that the Blasses take the child to the social services department in Plymouth the next day. He noticed that they didn't come to Sunday services that weekend, which was a little odd. They were very regular churchgoers, so he dropped a little note in their mailbox that week. But when they didn't come the next week, too, he got worried, and he called, and he didn't get an answer. So he went out once again to their property. These are his notes, his writing about what he saw there. 
There was no answer when he knocked on the front door, even though the Blasi's car was still up front. He walked around the property for a bit. He looked into their barn, didn't see anything. So because the front door of the house was open just a few inches, he let himself inside. Up in the boys' room, the bed was unmade. He tapped on what he assumed was the Largo's bedroom door, and he didn't get a response. And Father Largo left. Uh, And a day later, the police got involved. The blasts were never seen again. The mysterious boy had disappeared, and it was like he had never touched anything inside or outside of the house. The most shallow areas of Squam Lake within two miles were searched at some point, and of course, the woods, but nothing was found. Not until three years later was this rail spike found in the woods by Roy's own nephew, uh, who had moved into the house. Roy had had about two dozen of these beside his woodpile. He often took things to a scrapyard nearby, and those spikes had remained right where they'd been in 1921. There were traces of his blood on the tip of this one, which you can just barely see in the photo. No fingerprints on the spike at all. You can go out to the property today in Anderson. This is how it looks now. It's owned by a professional songwriter. Father Largo's niece is still alive, and she owns his papers. The only way any of this would ever have been found is that Union Protestant Church started a project in 1970 to uh, collect its archives. But, of course, the focus today is on 1988, 67 years after the Blast's disappearance. I am a survivor of a certain infamous and tragic incident on June 20th of 1988. This is the first time I'm telling the entire story, so hopefully the technical end will hold up. I was 17 years old in June of 88. I just graduated from Concord High School toward the southern portion of New Hampshire. And a few weeks before the ceremony, my friends and I had started talking about doing some kind of trip, some kind of uh, event to mark the occasion, the transition. Uh, But our small little gang, I'll tell you, was not the most rebellious or rowdy, and so our ideas weren't very exotic. I didn't even have a driver's license, and only one of us had access to a car. And doing a beach week thing seemed too expensive and too far away. So different ideas were kicked around, but nothing seemed to develop, and we started running out of time until I latched onto a notion, which I'll describe here in just a little bit. So who were these friends from 35 years ago who are so elemental to the story? Well, like I said, we were the quote-unquote good kids. Uh, We were the ones who didn't know a lot about sex or drugs or even cutting class. All that just never entered our Sphere. We all grew up to think that the law laid down by our parents and our elders was just something you lived by. I would say my best friend back then was this gent, Justin Gary, who had kind of a famous family in the state. His father and his grandfather and his father were all prominent attorneys in Concord, and it was expected that Justin would do the same thing with his life. This is something he talked about with me a fair bit. I would say he was maybe the most joyless kid I've ever known. Not the most depressed or underprivileged, the most joyless. Uh, Looking back, I can start to perceive more and more how suffocated he had begun to feel about the path his life was taking. He had none of that giddy optimism about what was head for a solid college. He was a very funny kid, very dry sense of humor, but it felt like it only came out around me. Big imagination, too. Uh, Justin and I spent rainy days uh, coming up with these crazy narratives using only the baseball cards we had. We would, we would imagine entire games played out. The contest was usually uh, to be the one who could describe the craziest play. We also both had similar musical interests, which is sometimes the strongest bond you can have with someone when you're young. He was the one who broke me out of my uh, top 40 mold a little and turned me on to the folk music of the 50s and 60s. This is Lena Mitri. She was kind of the pragmatist of the group. Great dry sense of humor and terrific with a creative insult, but very studious, uh, more so than any of us. 
She was off to Swarthmore in the fall to study to become an architect, the only one of us headed out of state for college. Her parents and mine went to the same church, the First Church of Christ the Scientist. So we had uh, known each other in that way as well. But Lena stopped going when she was about 16, and this was where her individualistic streak came through. Totally on her own, she had begun to follow an interfaith movement called Subud. It's not a religion per se, but a, a set of practices, especially a kind of meditation practice designed to show Subud followers their own way toward God. At 17, 18, that was an unusual and exotic thing to us, her friends. I think we never quite got our heads around it. It seemed to be part of a different Lena that we never explored spirituality was maybe above our realm of awareness back then. She was a good sport about our lack of education about it. She would call us the lost idiots. This fellow with the goofy look on his face is Brett Smuckers. Uh, Maybe because of his last name, he got the disposition he did. Funniest kid on the block by far. Uh, Brett approached life like it was a Marx Brothers movie. He tended to apply that attitude and that logic to everything. It was Brett's idea that we should all form a comedy troupe after graduation and tour the country with it instead of going to college, a comedy troupe called Fatal Waffle. So for months, uh, back in the winter, he wrote material for us, and we all went about rehearsing it in our parents' basements, me, Brett, Justin, and Lena. And it was all terrible. And uh, we did eventually give up on that dream, much to Brett's chagrin. He could get a little dark, uh, like a lot of funny people. He had a fascination with some dark subjects. He found schoolwork so ridiculously easy that he stopped trying sometime around junior year. He could do all of it effortlessly, so it stopped being a challenge. And as a result, he slacked off and began to just squeak through with C's. His parents eventually put a gun to his head and said, listen... You're at least going to NHTI, Concord's Community College, come fall. And so he caved in and enrolled there. After our graduation trip, he was going to be working at the movie theater near our houses, so we were all excited to go see free movies. That was really it. I didn't have uh, any other friends, and neither did they, I don't think. We we did most things together, uh, a lot of walking around the mall and so forth, normal stuff. We had no social media or cell phones or the internet. We just had a lot of very frivolous and fun group times. We'd also all agree to read a book together sometimes and talk about it. Funny stuff, mostly. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or a Tom Robbins novel, maybe. All of us nerds off to different colleges come fall. So we finally developed a strategy for our trip. I summoned up the nerve to ask my father if we could use our family's vacation house on Upper Kimball Pond beside the Merriman Forest. It was a little tricky in my mind because I had never really asked for anything like that before. It was a place my father had inherited from Grandpa Mike. Not really a vacation house per se. It was a little run down. We almost never used it. My parents were never vacation people. This was something that was not in their vocabulary. They saw it as more of a, um, a financial bulwark against tough time someday. So it was kept up just enough to hold off the winter weather. My father paid some real estate company something to maintain it year after year. And so I had been in the house exactly twice my entire life, spent all of one night in it. And here the house is in 1986. I said, um, Dad, would it maybe possibly be okay if me and Justin and Brett and Lena spent the weekend there? The big innovation was my idea to hike there along the Cornhusk Trail, which would drop us only a fifth of a mile away from the house. Here's the map, which was created by the police, actually, for use at the trial. We'll be coming back to this occasionally. The plan was Lena's parents would drive us to the northeastern leg of the trail, six miles from its starting point, and we would walk 12 miles to the house. Now, none of us had ever really hiked much before. So the idea of going 12 miles was pretty epic. We had a choice to go about halfway and camp out at the big one Lancet shelter and start off again the next morning. But even that seemed kind of crazy and dangerous to us. So 
we decided to leave early in the morning on Saturday and walk straight through. The best memory I have of the run-up was going shopping with Brett for our supplies. We overbought crazily, uh, imagining this trek was so immense. Twelve miles, my goodness. So much bottled water, which in 1988 was still the kind of item most people just didn't buy. Uh, It still represented the height of physical commitment. So much food, probably enough for a week, having no idea how much that stuff would weigh on our backs. The one hitch in the plan was that Lena's parents did not like at all the fact that she would be alone with three boys. So the stipulation before she could go was that her cousin go with us. And none of us had ever met her. She was a year older. Her name was Danielle. Even Lena didn't know her very well. She went to Keene State College in Cheshire County. She would be entering her sophomore year there. So that was an odd little wrinkle in our group dynamic. You can see our path. This was not an especially difficult part of the trail. There's the camp spot there that we would not be camping at, two miles out from the house. Off we went, bright and early, on a kind of glum, overcast day, very hot, piling out of two cars. Me, Lena, Brett, Justin, and Danielle. We got rides from Lena's mother and Justin's father to the parking lot of the Hannaford supermarket near my house. It was a quarter-mile walk down the road to the trailhead. We were all in a pretty good mood. This was my and Justin's first experience with beef jerky. We stopped and rested a lot. The trail would occasionally brush the river. There were some nice views. Overall, we were very impressed with ourselves for walking that much. It's not an especially tough trail at all, wide and level, though it does have some deep and rough spots that can be a little little scary if you're out there around dusk. Lena's cousin, Danielle, was a little intimidating to us three guys as we walked along, I think. She was a very mature and fairly flirtatious person, very opinionated, uh, liked to talk about drinking. She really seemed older than 19. I don't think Lena liked her that much. They didn't normally spend a lot of time together. Almost right away, Danielle created a vibe we weren't used to. Someone like her tended not to really see a group like ours if we were to pass by in the school hallways. And now, here she was with us for a long stretch of time. There were a couple of times I requested to stop for water and to rest a bit, but really it was for a very different reason I hadn't told anyone. For the past four months, I'd been having some very worrying symptoms, uh, a pain in my side and intermittent nausea and backaches, and it all seemed to be escalating very slowly. Now, two weeks from that weekend was going to be a very big date for me. I would turn 18 officially, and it was more important than anyone realized. I had planned to finally go to a doctor and have myself checked out then, because at 18, I wouldn't have to tell my parents about it. I had been raised strictly as a Christian scientist, and even though I didn't think my parents would uh, forbid me from seeing a doctor, I felt the pressure to pray and try to um, outthink what seemed to be happening to me, which was it was how I'd been raised, and to go it alone, not to burden anyone else with my problem. You had a combination of things happening there. One was being naive, being so young, the belief that nothing truly serious could be wrong with me. And the other was a personality flaw, obviously. I felt a pressure from my mother and father that was maybe not truly their doing, but I didn't want to disappoint or anger them. So the days progressed, and I felt myself getting a little sicker, a little more in pain, but I had done nothing about it except worry imagining this magical day when at 18 I could walk into a clinic and they would cure me with whatever dimes I'd saved from my summer job. But deep down, I think that I was very afraid that something was going very wrong inside me. My excitement over the trip masked that a little. Uh, I was feeling all right that day, mostly. We were really taking our time. Um, We swam and we cobbled lunch together at this spot here. Uh, I was so skinny back then that I never even took my shirt off. I was very self-conscious. At the one Lancet shelter, we saw this man, 
an older man, looked pretty rough and unshaven, a huge old backpack beside him, falling apart. He was eating from a can sitting there. And I couldn't take my eyes off him. It reminded me that we were close to the wild and maybe there were lives being lived there. I, I couldn't possibly understand. Who knows who he was? Between the shelter and the house and the pond, it was only about a 45-minute walk. About a half hour outside the shelter, we knew we were getting close, and we were hurrying a bit because we heard a little thunder far off in the distance sometimes, and we were dripping with sweat. It was so muggy. But at one point, we had stopped for just a minute so Lena could tie her shoe. When she stood up again, she didn't move. She was looking almost straight up, and she motioned to me without speaking a word uh, to come over to her, and she pointed up. I looked up, and very high in a tree, I saw someone perched in the very highest branches. And what I saw bothered me so much that I just nodded to Lena as if to say, okay, I saw it, I got it, let's go. And I started to walk again, and she followed. I think by the look on my face, she knew that I had registered everything she had, but that we should keep moving because I was as confused as she was. We were on the same page. That was one of the least traveled parts of the trail, kind of a dry, dark stretch, even on summer weekends, not, not a lot of traffic. It was only a few minutes before we felt okay to mention it to the others. Out of context, it meant nothing much, but whoever was sitting up so high in the trees was wearing something very odd. It looked like it might have been just the top half of some kind of animal costume, like a spotted leopard. And Lena agreed. The top half of a leopard costume. To which Brett replied that tree leopards were responsible for 40 hiker deaths a year in New Hampshire and that we should keep moving. Everyone seemed to find the whole thing a little funnier than I did, or Lena did. But we got to the house without incident uh, at around 2 o'clock. The house was just a couple of hundred yards from the trail, which kept going into the Merriman Forest itself, where the terrain could get a little rough for suburban kids like ourselves. Something I'd kind of forgotten about, because it seemed pretty insignificant to us for the weekend, was this old brown shed at the edge of the property. This was built at the same time the main house was in 1961. But after a flood, Grandpa Mike had never corrected a problem in the foundation. He thought it was too expensive. So the shed was more or less abandoned. And when my parents inherited the property, it sort of came along as a minor liability. Here's an entire aerial view of the layout, again from police evidence. You can see that there was no main road to the house per se. To get to it, you had to go down this single lane unpaved thing that fed out in two directions to a country road called Ridley Road. So the house felt fairly secluded, but in reality it wasn't exactly cut off. In fact, there was a little general store down the road and something that had just started to be constructed. It was going to be an indoor children's theme park for summer tourists. I remember all of us going into the house and thinking just, wow, it's all ours. And all of us claiming rooms to sleep in. And then we explored the property a bit. No one had mowed that summer yet. So it was kind of a jungle. Walking around the back is when I revealed a, a secret to Justin, which was that I wasn't sure if I'd be able to come with everyone when we took the canoes out to the pond the next day. Grandpa Mike had had two of them. Because I was worried about not having time to finish this a giant list of tasks my father had given me involving the house. I took out of my pocket this comically big piece of paper, I guess, printed out on my dot matrix printer, this checklist of cleaning and maintenance tasks that had been part of the conditions of me being allowed to use the house. Here I was on maybe the last getaway with my high school friends, and I was going to have to spend half of it raking and scrubbing the bathtubs. Of course, Justin understood about thankless obligations. What we all seemed to want, except Danielle, who was all energy, was a nap. So we retired to our rooms and collapsed for a while. I was downstairs here, and you can see where everyone else decided to camp and drop their stuff upstairs. 
I was in this semi-finished basement with a washer dryer and not much else except for my little room enclosure. Everyone else got a nicer spot. We've all been in places like this basement a thousand times where you see the insulation peeking through and the duct work and it seems very cold and metallic and there's too much cement. I noticed that a lot of restaurants have adopted this trend of exposed pipes and ducts and distressed cement floors. It became very in vogue at some point, still is. And I find I can't go into any of them because I immediately begin to tremble badly and my heart races and I can't breathe. It's another part of the legacy of that weekend, I guess you'd say. Dinner took up most of our attention then. Each one of us had some component of it. We'd hiked out there. And it became a very home ec class kind of vibe, a lot of fun as we pieced together our dinner for the night. We ate at about 5, 5.30, out on the back deck. And at one point we had to gather up all the stuff and dodge a very quick passing rain shower. After that, the weather held almost all night. Over dinner, we bored Danielle a little uh, because Lena wanted to read something to all of us. It was a funny piece she'd found in a magazine by Fran Leibowitz. Uh, Lena loved to read out loud. She liked working on her voice. She was always self-conscious about it. She'd been teased sometimes. She hated how high-pitched it was. So Danielle left that to us and went to turn on, I think it was an episode of Fame, the TV show. I mentioned that Lena had become a practitioner of SUBUD, which is an acronym of Suzila Bodhi Dharma. There were about 10,000 people worldwide at the time who practiced it. In SUBUD, there is a spiritual exercise called the Lydion. It's meant to draw power and guidance from the great life force. This is something that's usually done in groups, but it can be done in isolation. Lena performed Lady on once a week like clockwork. I can think of a couple of times where the four of us had rearranged plans so she could. And she told us she intended to do it that weekend. She thought it would be the perfect place. In Lady on, she would sit and empty her mind. And she told us that sometimes, not often, she felt herself become imbued with some feeling of connection to something bigger than herself, very warm and secure. And she thought that she could sometimes feel her soul fluttering inside her chest. It's a physical feeling, which she said a lot of Subu practitioners could replicate during Ladion. She was always a little cautious before mentioning this to Brett. Brett's muckers did not have the most accepting worldview when it came to spirituality. He said once, if God was real, he would not have allowed Teen Wolf 2 to happen. At about 6.30, Lena washed up and told us she was going out to do Lady On for about half an hour. She would go out near the old brown shed to do that, the clearing between the back of the shed and the trail. She said that week she had a very specific question she wanted to get guidance to. She just didn't tell us what it was. I remember watching Brett, watching Lena walk across the back of the property toward the shed. I was in the kitchen looking out onto the deck. And he was out there looking down at her from high above. He never took his eyes off her as she walked to the grass. It was a look on his face that I wasn't used to. A very serious look for Brett. Like adulthood was catching up to him all at once in one moment. Like he was realizing Lena would be gone soon. And we were all just going to be sad about that. To me, his face had always looked like his last name, just a little bit uh, silly but not right then, not at all. At about 7.15, I think, Lena came back to the house and told us she'd gone into the shed. She'd tried the door because I'd mentioned there might be some more blankets inside we could use since we didn't have quite enough to go around. She looked in for just a minute and then she'd come to get us. She wanted us to come look at what she'd found. So again, it was Lena being the first one to experience something a little strange. All of us went out to the shed with her. It was getting dark by then, so out came a couple of flashlights. There were plenty of those in the house. We tramped across the lawn. And I will always think I was the one who seemed the most uncomfortable in that environment, under the dark sky out there in the woods. It's, it, was, it was very alien to me. The insect seemed uh, extremely loud. 
very off-putting. The woods seemed so dark around us and sort of haunted. I would look at my friends, I would look at Danielle, and I would wonder how they seemed so composed in this different world, so far away from people, from our parents. Or maybe they weren't. Maybe we were all acting a little for each other's sake. And on the way, at one point, I almost bent over in pain on my left side. I told Brett I just pulled something on the hike that was still bothering me. Being out there with my friends had made me briefly forget my health problem, but it came back in that moment as if warning me. I had about 14 more days till I turned 18, 14 more days till I could feel good about getting treatment. We found things in the shed that didn't make sense. From the time we found them to the time the police took these photographs, the key objects were not moved. You can see a big piece of tarp in one corner, folded in such a way to suggest it may have been used as a kind of blanket. Notice how it's bunched up on one end, as if someone was trying to fashion a headrest, a kind of pillow. There was a pair of mismatched shoes, one size 11, one size 12, both men's sneakers, but of varying ages, seemingly, one much more worn than the other. There was this old pot of water that was later found to be pond water. There in the dark, the four of us didn't know that. We assumed it was regular drinking water. In and of themselves, there was not much reason to be overly suspicious of any of this particular set of things. Keep in mind that none of us had ever been in the shed before, and that included me, except for one time about two years before. My memory didn't really go back that far with any detail, so we wouldn't know what sort of things we might find out there. There was also a fairly bad smell in there, in the shed, like an animal may have died in or near it, so we didn't stay long. I called my father when we got back inside the house, and I let him know that there was maybe a homeless person who had been living in the shed. I described what we'd found. Now, when I did this, everyone was pretty much an earshot of me, and all they saw me do was nod a lot and say, okay, Dad, okay, okay, Dad, like that. And I hung up the phone, and I said to everybody that my father didn't see a problem, but that he did want a couple of things brought into the house before it got full dark. That visibly relieved everyone, I think. And I started out, but on the way out the back door on the first floor, I asked Justin if he wanted to come with me because I could use another pair of hands, and he said yes. In actuality, my father had told me something very different on the phone, but I hadn't wanted to alarm anyone. Uh, Justin and I were walking across the backyard toward the shed again, and I told him, quietly, that my father had confirmed that no, none of those things should have been in there. What he had told me to do was go back out to the shed and chain lock it, if I could. There was a chain lock kept in there. Instead of calling the police, which he'd said, frankly, would likely have been pointless, he'd said to just lock it up and make sure the house doors were locked, and he would deal with the shed later. I wanted Justin to know more than anyone else because he had that maturity about him. I thought I could pretty much tell him anything, and his reaction would be a very, very sober one. So out there I held the flashlight, and Justin went about securing the shed with an old padlock and chain. He was far better with mechanisms than I was. He was working very quickly. That was obvious. Neither one of us was at all comfortable being out there. It was now full dark. We could hear very faintly some laughter coming from the house. It was Danielle's laughter. We got that done, but first we realized we'd have to pull the two canoes out of the shed and leave them in the grass for the next day. And as we were doing that, Justin began to talk. He told me that he was having trouble chilling out that weekend, too. And actually, I'm not even sure we said that phrase back then. Uh, He was having trouble relaxing. And he told me that he needed to spend some of the money he was making with his part-time job clerking at his father's law office on a math tutor. Math was a subject he'd had trouble with since sixth grade. But no amount of effort seemed to help Justin. Brilliant Justin grasp the more advanced concepts of geometry, trigonometry. He was a whiz at everything else. But he was genuinely worried that if he started classes in September, he wasn't going to be able to handle UNH. So he needed to start now. Knowing Justin, I felt like he was genuinely confused about his own inability to get this one thing right. 
and the possibility of real failure, the kind of failure I'd had in chemistry class, for example. That scared him. His trig teacher uh, was named Mr. Walpole, and he was notoriously humorless. He'd passed Justin with a C after Justin's father had talked to him at length, and this had mortified Justin, this intervention. The three of them sitting in a room and Justin's father essentially apologizing for him, and Mr. Walpole barely even looking at him. Justin told me as we were walking back across the lawn in the gloom that he'd had a nightmare just that week about Mr. Walpole, even after never having to talk to the man again. Justin said to me, You know, he always talked to me like he was on to me. No adult ever talked to me like that. I've thought about this in the intervening years. It was like Justin had one identity for me and my friends and all the adults that he's so impressed with his A's and his his, his flair with language and his pedigree. But this one man was seeing the failure in him and that shook him. So the efforts to get On top of the math, I think they were very important and intimidating. They were kind of clouding his thoughts of the upcoming first semester. These are a few more of the photos that the police took inside the shed. Just some. In reality, there were more than 150. So you can see that it corresponds to what I saw and Justin and Brett and Lena and Danielle. These on the other hand, are pictures my father had taken of the shed about a year before because he was trying to sell it to someone who bought a summer house just across the pond. He had the idea that it was mobile enough to move right off the property. Of course, what's not in these earlier pictures is the strange piece of tarp and the pot of water and the shoes. But let me go back and forth here, and you'll see there's one thing that is actually missing from the police photos, which was there in the pictures taken a year earlier. And that is this axe. It had been used just a couple of times for some old-fashioned wood chopping by my grandfather at some point, and then pretty much abandoned in the corner for good years before. This is the evidentiary close-up of the axe that was no longer there when we kids went into the shed. Like most people, I never knew the parts of an axe and how it has human attributes associated with it. This is a diagram I found that shows how every part of an axe does. Throat, shoulder, belly, eye. I've never been able to find out how these terms came to be, but I I found that very interesting. In ancient folklore, ancient traditions... The axe is connected to all sorts of concepts. Lightning, stopping rain. Sometimes an axe would be buried in the soil to ward off bad weather. In the way it opens the earth, it was seen long ago as a kind of penetration of the spirit into the earth. A connectedness formed there. Now, despite the unsettling feelings we'd gotten, Uh, We were teenagers, and we were resilient, and we tended to live in the moment. So I have to say that night at the house, that three-hour period when we got together in the living room was one of the fondest memories I have of our little group going back to the second year of junior high school. It really is. There was a botched attempt to make s'mores out on the deck. We didn't really grasp all the necessary concepts. But Lena had opened our eyes that very day, for the first time ever, to the concept of freezing Milky Ways. She'd ice-packed six of them and put them in her backpack, and she hustled them into the freezer as soon as we'd gotten to the house. And we nibbled on those as we all played cribbage. It was actually Danielle who taught us cribbage that night. She was an absolute demon at this game. Her boyfriend had taught her. And she had this lovely handmade scoring board for the game she'd brought special. She, I think, very intentionally sat right beside Justin as we played. She was very involved with showing him little things and playfully grabbing at his cards and quickly rubbing his shoulders with mock sympathy if he lost an especially close um, round. We all sort of noticed this. He wasn't terribly comfortable with it, I don't think. It was a lot of attention for him to receive from a girl all at once. 
Danielle was the only one of us who was having a little something adult to drink. She had found a bottle of gin my father kept in a cupboard, which may have even belonged to Grandpa Mike, for all I knew. And she swore no one would ever notice if she just took two fingers worth. And to her credit, that is all she drank. After that, we put on a movie that Brett had rented, which was The Believers with Martin Sheen. And when the movie ended, Brett got very animated. Uh, One of his grand projects he'd envisioned for us to do someday was a horror movie. He'd originally wanted to use the school's video camera, just sort of creatively borrow it, and get a bunch of people together and shoot this idea he had. And he really started pushing hard for it that night after watching The Believers. This is what we talked about. He was standing and acting things out as we laughed. But he was very serious. Uh, the concept he had was all over the place, but it was kind of interesting, really. It was, it was called Echo Island. We all had parts we would play, and Brett would too. He would also be the director. We were going to play research students dropped off at a remote island to take botanical extracts or some such. Brett even knew where we would shoot this, off Sandwich Bay, pretty close by. And in the plot, for mysterious reasons, no one was allowed on the island. It was forbidden by the government. But Brett, playing a brilliant and charismatic young professor, a real renegade, would take his students out by boat in the middle of the night to get these extracts, which would cure some kind of disease or another. And when we were out there, improvising our dialogue, no doubt, occasionally these hands would shoot up from the ground, grasping human hands, and they would grab us and pull us down into the earth. This was the the dark secret of the island. There were no people attached to these hands. They were simply hands. And there would be one giant mother hand, as I recall. Brett had been reading a book about practical effects, and he explained how he knew how we could do the effect with cardboard boxes and so forth and and, and blue screen and matte paintings. He was really excited. And we were all laughing and saying, yeah, you know what? We can do this just before summer ends. This is really a thing that we can do. It was Danielle who brought us down somewhat. She'd never heard such bull in her life. And she had all kinds of practical questions about the plausibility of this uh, concept. I could see the tension growing in Brett, who who did not like to be challenged. When he he was, he got very pouty and sullen. Like the rest of us, he didn't have an aggressive bone in his body, but Danielle did. Um, And she kind of took the air out of the room then. She was none too delicate about any of it. It felt like she was kind of challenging all four of us in a way which was a little bit of a sour note before we all went to bed at around 11.30. I went down to my basement room and turned in. I was kind of overwhelmed by the whole day. In recent weeks, when I laid down to sleep, all my mental defenses against the pain in my side and my back abandoned me alone there in the dark. And the pain would always revisit me almost right away after the lights went off. So sometimes to deal with it, I would play a kind of movie reel in my mind, my own version of meditation, I suppose. And in it, I would be entering a grand church, like nothing we had in Concord, a church like I imagined would only be found in medieval Europe, enormous and warm and lit by candlelight. And I would enter alone on a summer morning at dawn, with birds singing everywhere in the trees, and the doors would close behind me. My version of counting sheep became blowing out row after row of tall candles that would be lined up all the way down the center aisle between the pews. One by one, I would blow them out, and I felt warm and safe, and eventually this would get me to sleep. But that night in the house on Upper Kimball Pond, I was thinking more about Brett's horror movie. I was really hoping we'd do it, you know. What a great way for us all to hang out together for one last stretch before we got pulled apart. Not just every few days, but every day. It sounded wonderful to me. I would have told Brett a different story, though. I thought I had a better idea for his movie. Because I'm sure I was the only one of us who had ever heard of The Smoke Child. It was an actual legend from colonial times when the first English settlers had come to the shores of Plymouth. It was written that those first winters were so hard that very soon no orphans could be cared for. 
There just wasn't enough food, enough wood, enough medicine. And so many were left to die or put to death. It was a fate to be deeply feared, to be orphaned with no hope in such a harsh place. It was a death sentence. Tales would be told and historians would later write about the smoke child. One little parentless boy in particular forced to survive off the land when the grown men of Plymouth came for him to put him to a merciful death by drowning. He disappeared in terror and in the forests of Situate he became bestial, savage. He was even seen all the way west in Taunton and Swansea as the Plymouth colony expanded, eventually deep into the area we now call New England. And with time, he became known as a spirit, a kind of phantom, like the Wendigo. He would appear in the night and then vanish just as quickly. That's his name. The smoke child, it was written, knew only one thing, that no one he encountered must ever find out that he was an orphan. For that meant death. And he would kill whenever he felt his secret was threatened. I woke up at a little past two in the morning, and and nothing made this happen, no sound in particular. I just woke up. It might have been paranoia about the locks in the house, because I, I got up then, and I decided to just check the locks in the front and the back. No big deal. I had been trusted with this house, and I, I never stopped worrying about it, especially after the shed. So I left the room, and I went up to the main floor. And right away, in a weird coincidence, standing at the top of the steps, in the dark was Danielle, in a t-shirt and shorts. She was saying that she'd heard something, and the back door was open. I followed her very quietly through the living room, and yes, the back door was ajar. It was open about eight inches. She thought that Lena had gone out, and uh, I said, well, why would she want to do that? Danielle didn't know, but maybe she said uh, it was part of her prayers. That's what Danielle called them, her prayers. I said, I'd go take a walk out there, and she said, okay, I'm going back to sleep. I kind of watched her go up the steps to the top floor, and she turned left at the top of them instead of right. To go to the right, I knew that's where her room was, but left, down the hall that way, that was that was Justin's room, not hers, Justin's. So I wasn't sure what was going on there. I I actually waited at the bottom of the steps for her to reappear and correct herself. Maybe she was sleepy and disoriented, but she never did. Out back, the night was very calm. I walked about halfway across the backyard toward the shed, and then I veered off away from it. It made me very nervous. I went toward the opening at the back of the property where you could step onto the Cornhusk Trail and beside that, the pond. I was half scared of the night, but uh, half emboldened too. It, It felt so freeing to be out that late, so far away from home. I literally almost stepped on something that was lying in the grass very close to the shed on the side facing away from the house, and here that thing is. It was folded over, so even if it had been daylight, it might have looked only like a a carpet sample or something. This is the bottom half of some kind of costume, later identified as the property of Prince Whipple High School, six miles away. I didn't even touch it. That was for someone to do later. It was found to be extremely dirty, even moldy, infested with ants. Somehow I do not remember making the mental connection to what we had seen up in the tree just the day before, earlier that same day, really. Kind of an extraordinary blackout on my part, I know, but it wouldn't have changed anything. It would have made me only more afraid than I already was. I parted the trees, and I could see the pond there, and and turning to my left, I saw a shape walking away from me down the trail. And just by the way he walked, I knew it was Brett. Brett was out here in the middle of the night. I said his name, and he turned around, but he didn't come any closer. I had to go to him. I asked him what was up, and he clearly seemed agitated, not like himself. He he said he was just walking. He needed to get out. He said, I don't get her, man. I guess I just don't get her. Like I was supposed to know who he was talking about. He was talking about Lena. He said, "I, I just don't get her. And he turned away from me and he began to walk down the trail, just going away kind of quickly, very aggravated. 
obviously wanting to be alone. Well, I was totally confused. Uh, walking back, I looked out on the pond and I saw a uh, black smudge out there on the water in the moonlight, a, a canoe just drifting along. The water was perfectly still. I made my way along the trail, hugging the shoreline of the pond, and I managed to get a little closer to the canoe, which was only about 100 yards off the shore. And I saw someone sitting in the canoe who might have been Lena. I raised my hand, and she raised her hand back, but she made no move to paddle towards me. There was something very non-recreational about what she was doing. She was just drifting. And... Even though she was just a a silhouette, I could see that she had turned away. She didn't want to have any more contact at that moment. So it was Lena. That that was clear. And I figured uh, she and Brett must have been out here together for some reason, having pulled one of the canoes down into the water so late at night. I sat on the bank for a little bit, just waiting for her, but uh, she wasn't coming back in. She kept drifting and didn't make any more contact with me. I started walking down the trail to catch up to Brett. He was already well out of sight. I had a flashlight with me so I could see enough to keep going, but I I didn't understand why he had gone so far, because without a flashlight, and he definitely didn't have one, it was just impossibly dark out there. The minutes passed, and the furthest I was willing to go was this little landmark on the water here, this beaten old pier that was the property of the people who owned a, uh, a lightless house up the ridge. They seemed to be gone for the weekend. At that point, you can see from the map what, what had happened here geographically. A, a separation had occurred. The five of us were spread out as much as we had ever been, as much as we could realistically be. I was now almost a quarter mile from the point on the shore where Lena would have pushed off in the canoe. I turned back and I called Brett's name out a couple of times and I got no answer. There was a, a break-off path, a very small thing right here. Its only purpose seemed to be to serve as a, as a, as a long cut through to Ridley Road. As we'd been walking that day, Justin and Brett had accidentally turned and started down this path before I reminded everyone that we had farther to go. I shone the flashlight down it. I only had a range of about 50 feet with the light. I was afraid to go down there alone. This is pretty much the exact view I had. I duplicated it for this photograph I took three weeks ago. I tried to even approximate the wattage of the flashlight. I didn't have to go anywhere, though, because I saw something there at the edge of the beam's reach, and I went toward it. It was someone's arm. It had been severed from someone's body several inches above the elbow. My first reaction was to backpedal, and and as I did so, I saw the rest of the body in the dark. It was only about 20 feet away on the path. The initial attack must have taken place at the spot where the arm was. And then the victim, who was Brett, had run or staggered forward in an attempt to get away. In the dark, I didn't see nearly as much blood as there probably Was And in fact, I've never seen a photograph that depicted the area in enough detail to show that. Brett was lying perfectly face up and his his, his face was completely pale, entirely gray. Uh, I didn't think he was breathing. The middle of his chest looked like maybe some animal had gotten at it. There was a, a giant, almost perfectly round, dark stain from his neck all the way down to his stomach and, and spanning his torso. For some reason in the moment, I thought I needed to see his eyes very closely. So I knelt and I leaned real close to them because they were open. Though either the right or the left one, I don't remember which, had a great splotch of of blood in it. In fact, for a second, I thought Brett's nose was gone. But it was just that blood had streaked upwards from his chest and obscured it so that his face looked like it was in two distinct halves separated by this thick line of blood. His eyeballs were glassy and enlarged. I was with him for all of 10 seconds, probably, and that was it. No attempt at resuscitation. I uh, it took the impression that he was dead. I think I said his name maybe 20 or 30 times as if that would revive him somehow. 
I, I feel I need to give a warning about this next photo, this police photo of Brett's body. When I've been frightened before in the past, of course, like everyone else, my hands shake, but something else was happening. A, a once-in-a-lifetime phenomenon, I, I hope. This kind of shaking was more like I was having a terrible, exaggerated muscle tremors. I was having trouble even holding the flashlight. I was, I, was, I was like a small child taken out of freezing water before someone can be there with a blanket. Um, and my legs gave out the first time I tried to turn and, and use them, just gave out entirely like someone had removed the muscles entirely. But then I was able to get up and run back down the path. I was calling out for Lena, but I think, I think no sound was coming out of my mouth. And all the pain in my side, which had been persistent since I'd awoken, it it vanished under the adrenaline. Lena wasn't on the pond anymore. It had been about 20 minutes since I'd last seen her. She had guided the canoe back onto the shore and, 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 and left it there. It was almost as if she had waited for me to go out of sight and then immediately come back in, like she was avoiding me as well as Brett. So I ran for the house immediately, and... As I went, something happened to the flashlight. I must have dropped it because it was, it was found just barely in the water, about a foot off the shore. I didn't realize it. The police found this troubling and convenient because obviously in the flashlight rolling or being dropped into the water, fingerprints, possibly bloody fingerprints, would be removed and in general make the timeline of my actions more difficult to interpret. I was terrified to go near the shed as I ran through the yard, so I believe I found this extra burst of speed as I went past it. You see here how I I would have gotten into the back door of the house, and it was where Lena was trying to get to. Lena was lying in the grass just about 20 feet before the back door. She had suffered two severe axe strikes. The coroner's report determined that the cause of death was probably not the deep one to her upper back, which may have incapacitated her, but a... A second strike, which damaged the right half of her neck and opened up a wound from which blood flowed freely. She was likely dead within moments. There was no physical evidence that she'd been able to elude her assailant at all after that first axe swing. She went down and did not crawl forward. My body took me inside the house. I won't comment about what my mind was doing because it was somewhere else, somewhere it had never been that was unknowable. So I think in terms of my body alone. Up the basement stairs, in the dark, and into the living room. I I still had enough awareness to get to the phone right away and to know what I had to ask my father. And as the phone rang at the house 16 miles away, I was constantly moving my eyes from one corner of the living room to the next in this, this constant paranoid rotation. I didn't turn on the lights. I was afraid to see anything. My father picked up. He came awake from sleeping. And he made out from my babbling that something terrible had happened. And and I needed to call the police, but I didn't know the address of the house. I had never actually known the, the, the actual address. And he was very calm and he gave it to me. And it didn't matter one bit because I didn't retain one single fragment of that information. He heard in my voice that I was in serious danger, and he said he was coming, and he asked if I could get outside the house. My father told me that if I couldn't get out, that I should go into the basement and go through the door behind the Welsh dresser. That was the last thing we said to each other. I disconnected, and I dialed 911. I told the operator that people were dead and that I was in a house on Ridley Road with a stone mailbox in front of it near the general store. And hung up. The place my father had told me to go if I couldn't get out of the house was a place I did not know existed. Obviously, I knew about the basement, but not the annex to it. It had never been mentioned, not once in my life. I did not go down there, but I will show you a combination of photographs here. This is the the very large Welsh dresser that had been placed in front of the door to the annex at some point. When this was moved away, here is the entrance. And here are photographs of what this uh, annex consisted of, where my father believed I would be safer. 
You could see it was nothing more than a great hollow with these wooden supports built through it. There was no electricity in there, no lights. One bend to the left, making the shape of an L. And it, then it's just a dead end. My father meant well with this panicked suggestion, but in reality it would have been a death trap. We'll come back to this annex a little later and what the police thought it may have meant. I found myself unable to leave the house until I knew if Justin and Danielle were all right and if they could help me, and that meant going upstairs. I went up in the dark. The 911 dispatcher had told me they would be at the house within minutes. I had with me a cane, my Grandpa Mike's cane, which had been against the wall near the phone. This was my protection, a cane. I turned left at the top of the stairs and went into Justin's room. The door was open. It was dark in there. And the window was wide open. The bed was rumpled a little like someone had been lying in it. I went to the window itself and I looked out and down. There had been a a confrontation there in the bedroom, though there was no blood. Justin had been able to ward someone off and then tried to escape, or he had heard something that sent him out the window, believing he was safest trying to get out. And he had jumped and landed in the worst possible way, but probably he had fallen and died of injuries to his neck upon hitting the ground. He'd hit the ground in such a way as to cause death before the police and ambulance could arrive. There was a a stone patio down there which he had struck. So when I looked out the window, I saw him down there in the dark, not moving. No visible blood. It had begun to rain at some point very lightly. Justin's body was was getting wet. I went back out into the hallway, and I'm not sure why I didn't go toward Danielle's room. Instead, I went back down the stairs directly. I intended to run for the main road and keep moving until the police came. Running felt like the safest thing to do. I got out of the house through the front door. In front of me was the yard and the gravel path that led about a fifth of a mile to Ridley Road. And standing right there, at the point where the gravel path first began to bend, there was a person hunched over, holding an axe in one hand, upright but down next to its side. So the the head of the axe was perched in the grass. And this person saw me and immediately began to come for me. Suddenly the axe was in both his hands and he was coming. Here was my position approximately in the red circle. You can see that there was a choice to be made and it was made by pure instinct and fear. I chose to run the way the arrow was pointing on the screen toward the woods. I knew the woods were not the most dense and this was also a way to get to Ridley Road. If I ran fast enough, I could make it. But nothing would get me back inside that house again, despite the fact that I could have shut the front door behind me and probably had time to lock it. So I would have to be chased into the woods, and that is exactly what happened. I was going blind into the woods. It was really raining now. Uh, A thunderhead was passing over. It must be said that I felt almost like I was flying, almost like I was aloft. There was such electricity in my body, but I knew I was being chased. Uh, my screaming did come then, finally. It was, just, it was just the word help over and over. This is the layout of the area as I ran. And in the middle of the night, clearly no one was going to hear me until I got to at least here. And the very bad mistake I made was that Ridley Road is accessed from this spot here. Where I was running to, bending to the left, was away from that. I was running toward a more desolate area. And if I kept going, the police would arrive from this direction to find just an empty house with dead bodies. But this information meant nothing to me. I was completely out of control. I knew one thing, which was that someone was coming for me. And I had to live. These are my photos from a couple of months ago. The woods in that area were pretty thin, with some open clearings that were very bumpy and chewed. But it allowed me to move so fast that I I couldn't understand why after just a couple of minutes I hadn't hit the road yet. It was because my sense of direction was shot in the dark and the rain. Pretty soon I could feel my lungs start to give out, and then I thought I had found some kind of safety. Because there were lights up ahead through the trees, very dim, but they looked like house lights to me. I kept screaming as I got closer. I took exactly one look behind me as I ran, but uh, the field of vision behind me was just a blur of, of rain and darkness. 
but I did think I could hear running feet in addition to my own. I came out of the woods, and I was running toward the lights, and I saw there was no house. It was something very different. In April of that year, construction had begun on the Merriman Fun Center, scheduled to be completed by September 15th, just before the snows came that year. This was the indoor children's amusement park that still stands today, more than 30 years later, still in operation during the spring, summer, and fall. Bounce houses, trampolines, bowling, and an arcade. At that time, on June 20th, 1988, the foundation was still in the process of being laid, and just a few lights were kept on during the night by safety law. The area had been surrounded only by very weak rubber-orange fencing that only came up to about above the knee in some places, and it didn't even connect all the way around. There was a, a maze of tall iron and steel supports in front of me, and big sections of cement wall here and there, some of it connecting to other sections, but some of it not. No ceiling anywhere. I was looking at the beginning of the construction of that first level, and I ran right into the heart of that structure. And as I did, I could hear a police siren in the distance. And when I say amazed, that's really what it was. I was maneuvering through this place that seemed designed to stop me. The surface was dirt in most places, sometimes a a two or three foot pile of it blocking me. The cement walls had these big cutouts in the middle that you see here, maybe to make it easy for materials to be passed through. And a couple of times I had to climb through one. In another place, I almost overran a drop of about three feet to a slightly lower level, dug more deeply to the ground. The lights were truly pathetic. They didn't do anything when I got this deep into the place. It was was dark. I was so winded, I finally had to stop. I just had to. So I pressed myself with my back against one of the cement walls. It only went to about a foot over my head. And I listened to that siren, but it faded. And that was an awful moment to think that maybe I was wrong about what it meant. It felt like I just wasn't going to be able to get my breath back. That just wasn't going to happen. And that was the first moment I realized how heavy the rain had really gotten. I was getting drenched. The siren had stopped, and there was that soft tapping of the rain on on dirt all around me. I could hear things very clearly then. It was only about a minute after I had stopped running that I heard a thump, like someone had jumped from one elevation to another, down to where I was. I've tried to show here in a sketch from memory where my pursuer went by me on my left when I got my closest look at him from 10 feet away. He was moving very slowly and deliberately. And it was only because he didn't turn his head to the right that he didn't see me cowering in place. The boy was about average height for someone maybe 13 years old, holding the axe in both hands as he moved. He had medium-length hair that looked very ragged, uncombed, black hair, if I had to guess. And he was completely naked. He wasn't wearing anything at all. His right arm was coated in blood from his shoulder to his wrist. He moved past a divide where parts of two cement walls met. And then he was gone. I didn't have much logical thought left, but I had a a powerful instinct to be hidden until I felt he was truly gone. Just off to my right, there was a triangular stack of cement pipes, three of them, that were incredibly long, 30 feet maybe. I held my breath, I was trying to make no sound, and I, I climbed into the one on top of this pyramidal stack. It was about three feet high, and there was room to maneuver inside of it. I, I crawled deeper and deeper, and as it got ever darker, I felt safer. In my mind, even if my pursuer were to find me inside this pipe, he would have to come in there, or he would have no ability to attack me. I was deluded into thinking I had an advantage there. I stopped at the midpoint of the pipe, and I pushed my back against the curve, and I curled up tight into a ball. And I watched the rain coming down through the holes on either side of the pipe. Inside, it sounded really loud, Hit, you know, the, the rain hitting the outside of the pipe. I was constantly turning my head from one viewpoint of one end of the pipe to the other. And once when I looked to the end opposite of where I'd crawled into, I saw a face. But it was a different face. It was a woman. She was standing in the rain and partially leaning into the pipe and she was beckoning me, waving me with one hand to come to her. And I felt I'd been saved. The police were here. But as soon as I started to move toward her, I heard something 
slam six inches above my head. Something made of, of iron or steel struck the outside of the pipe with tremendous force right above my head. It shot this echo into my ears that deadened my hearing and blacked it out. I screamed at this woman to help me, but she just kept waving at me. Come on, come on. What I believe was the axe hit the pipe one more time, like whoever was out there thought he could hack through it. But this time it sounded muddled because my eardrums had sustained real damage. I crawled very painfully on my hands and knees toward the end of the pipe, toward this woman. Even before I got out of the pipe, she was moving ahead of me. I jumped out onto the ground, and she was already 20 or 30 feet ahead. Come on, come on. Now she had a real voice, and I saw her whole body. She was so much older than I was. She was in her 60s, maybe. And I ran after her. She was almost impossible to keep up with, but she seemed to know exactly what turns to make among all the walls and the dirt piles and the, the stacks of iron and pipe and the temporary cement and steel supports. She was incredibly quick, and she was taking a lot of turns. And sometimes she would go out of sight and then appear again, and she was only getting farther and farther away. But then she was scrambling up an incline, and she was out of the maze entirely, and so was I. I was in a clearing, and Ridley Road was ahead of us. And that's where I lost her in the dark. She had accelerated on foot so much that she vanished to me. And then my shoes were on the pavement, on the road, and just a few seconds after that is where my memory stopped for a time. Right about when a police car spotted me on the road. One of the two officers inside it claimed, rather controversially, that my first movements in his sight were not of hysterical panic, but of deliberate evasion. And they caught up to me quickly. Danielle's time of death was unofficially judged to have occurred most likely after Justin leapt or fell or was pushed from the window of his bedroom. The upstairs hallway was just too dark for me to have seen her body. She had fallen just outside the door to her own bedroom and was apparently headed there. Maybe she wasn't able to get down the stairs. I think this next photograph is quite graphic as well, and I apologize. There was a gouge here in the wall at the end of the hallway, and based on the based on the spray of the blood shown here and what happened to Danielle, it was thought that she had been pushed momentarily against the wall, and then with seemingly one swing of the axe, she was killed. The axe head probably went through her five feet eight inches off the floor and caused what it caused. I was sedated for a little over 24 hours, and I was actually moved out of the county with as much secrecy as was allowed. There was so much attention immediately about what happened. I was allowed to rest a little while after that, and after a couple of doctors judged that I was no longer under any real influence of the meds, the questions began. The detective who questioned me the most was this woman, Deborah Chopin of the New Hampshire Police. She'd been a detective for about 11 years, she initially had me tell the story without interruption over the course of two hours. She was very firm in this. She didn't want to interrupt me at all. So I got it all out, and she came back the next morning. There were a lot of things she did not understand, to say the least. Most of this case, of course, was about physical evidence. But Ms. Chopin didn't challenge me on any of that at first. She wanted to know before anything why I had suggested this trip to the people who were now all dead. What was it about this isolated location, this set of circumstances I thought would be a good idea? She pointed out that based on what I told her already, I had never done this kind of hike or even this kind of overnight stay before, not one time in my life. And yet I had said to my friends, let's go here at this time, walk into the woods by ourselves, just us. Only about a week after the incident, the police came across the letters I'd kept in my desk drawer at home. There were three of them, just three, about a page long each. These were letters I'd never sent and never planned to send, written between March and May of 1988. They'd been written to Lena. I've put one up on the screen here. They were called love letters, and certainly that is correct. In one, I agonized to her about what I perceived as the religious issue between us, and my fear of my parents' disapproval of her dropping out of our church to go her own way. And in this passage here, you can see 
how woefully uneducated I was about Subud, having childishly done no research into it, thinking it was uh, an intense Eastern philosophy that my mom and dad would not believe could coexist with us. My writing was mopey and self-absorbed and flowery. Yes, of course, being 17, you can see what a bad poet I might have turned out to be. But who among us has not written such letters? These just confirmed that Lena and I had never spoken about a possible dating relationship. She'd never given any indication she wanted one, neither had I. It was adolescent pining, pure and simple. But Detective Chopin believed that perhaps I had come to perceive Brett Smuckers as a rival for Lena's affection. Probably long before that weekend, she began to suggest I was in a great deal of confusion leading up to June 20th. Racked by pain, I was keeping a secret and perhaps believing I was even going to die, I was approaching the moment when my only friends were breaking away from me, especially Lena. I was feeling pressured and maybe angered by my restrictive parents, who I thought might be keeping me from Lena and my own physical health. Chopin believed I had deeply internalized my religious upbringing. And then Danielle entered the picture. Danielle, who seemed maybe to very suddenly be taking Justin from me. In the eyes of a virginal, somewhat lonely teenager, this all represented a storm of inner conflict. I was extensively checked out by doctors just before I was allowed to go home with my parents. My ailment proved to be a serious kidney and lung infection that was in fact treatable, and it has never been a problem since it was cured in the summer of 1988. The weeks passed, uh, with me never leaving my parents' house, and lots of questions continuing. Detective Chopin asked me more extensively about my past with my friends, as she felt the picture that was emerging was not quite how I'd originally depicted it. Her opinion was that while Justin, Brett, and Lena were in fact my only friends, they themselves did have others. Their world had not revolved around mine as mine had around theirs. But as I said before, the case really was about physical evidence, and eventually in 1989 I was in fact charged and arrested at the age of 18, and there was a trial. Footprint evidence was a very tricky thing in 1989, still is today. If there is blood at an outdoor crime scene and it rains, the blood may become so diluted that the testing of the blood becomes impossible. But inside the house despite the probable contamination of the scene all over by my footprints and those of the first responders, no hard evidence of bare footprints was found, nor were any fingerprints or hairs suggesting that an outsider had come in and caused the deaths of my friends. Other problems lingered too. My path on the trail suggested that the assailant would likely have to have either passed me or passed very near me in the dark after the murder of Brett Smuckers and before the murder of Lena Mitri. Yet I had been conveniently spared. The axe itself was found in Upper Kimball Pond, close to the old brown shed, still partially bloody but with no fingerprints, which meant that the person I had described would have had to go back to the pond to dispose of it after chasing me into the woods. And the fingerprints on the objects inside the shed, the tarp, the container of water, there were none at all. The police could not determine just when those objects had been placed. The bottom half of the leopard mascot costume was similarly without usable prints, but its condition was very deteriorated. There were a couple of points in my favor. The pattern of my own footprints inside the house did not prove much of anything, in particular a confrontation with either Justin or Danielle. And when I had claimed that the assailant had attempted to hack through that cement pipe to either get at me or flush me out in the waning minutes of this catastrophe, that claim seemed to be supported by some markings on the exterior of the pipe, although it was pointed out at the trial that these could have been manufactured, and it wasn't possible to tell what object had actually made those marks. The surfaces all around that foundation and the woods around it were hopelessly slick and muddy, and the rain ruined most evidence of anyone's presence there. I should 
confess now that I never told the police about the woman I saw who had guided me out of the foundation. The reason for this is simple. Even I don't think she was real. There were split-second moments where I believe I got a good look at her face. And yes, I do believe it was a momentary projection born from my mental trauma, a projection into the future. I believe that woman was Lena, the older Lena who never became old, never became a woman in her 60s like I saw her that night. It was essentially the same face, but aged with long flowing gray hair instead of her long flowing black hair, the kind of hair she shared with her cousin, Danielle. It was 10 years before I told anyone about that aspect of my escape from the foundation of the Merriman Fun Center. The last part of the trial, and I've blocked out a lot of it, to be honest, featured a bit of prosecutorial overreach. The state prosecutor, Henry Odette, had a slightly crazed theory that the reason none of us had taken any photos that weekend of our trip down the trail and at the house was because maybe I had very specifically told my friends not to bring cameras. No one's parents, not even my own, seemed to remember quite what I was wearing when I first left my house, and so there was no way to really know for sure without pictures whether maybe there were two sets of my clothes, one with my friend's blood all over them, and one I had actually been wearing when I stumbled onto Ridley Road. Maybe I had buried or submerged those bloody clothes in the middle of the pond and then changed, Odette thought. But no trove of my clothing was ever found. Odette got a lot of criticism for hitting this theory so hard, but many did find it odd that no one had brought a camera to get shots of such an important event in our lives. I offer a simple explanation for why we didn't. We just thought we'd have more chances. As for the strange annex to the basement of the house, it was my father, my poor suffering father, who eventually had to endure the most severe questioning about it, and especially why he had never told anyone in the family it was there. As part of the investigation, it had been examined extensively, and faint traces of blood were visible to the naked eye in two places on the wooden supports. But it was not the blood of anyone related to any of the events of that weekend. In fact, it was at least 20 years old. The annex was not part of the original construction. My grandfather, Grandpa Mike, had apparently built it himself, maybe for extra storage, but that big cold space was totally empty. And because he had died in 1981, he wasn't around to answer questions about it. My father said he discovered it by accident after Grandpa Mike died, and he felt it made sense to block it off. It was determined those traces of blood were actually from two different people, neither ever identified. Both long gone now, maybe. Deborah Chopin was quite obsessed by that blood, I'll tell you, to to the point where she shared every petty thing she found out about my Grandpa Mike to my parents. I wrote a letter to her a few months ago. She's retired now. And I said in that letter, tell me something. Throughout my trial and the state's inability to make it clear whether I at 17 had planned everything or was set off by something that happened at the house itself that night, through the state's loss of key physical evidence, all the conflicting things about the case, did you ever really think that Maybe my grandfather or even my father had committed some unspeakable crimes in the past and had been trying to cover them up, and maybe some kind of homicidal darkness had been passed on to me. Did you ever really believe that? I got no response to my letter. My father died in 1991. The house by the pond, the brown shed, the basement annex were all torn down a year later. Over the years, I've gotten all kinds of mail, as you can imagine. A lot of it condemnatory, of course. God knows how these people keep finding me now. 
But once in a while, I will get a letter from someone who believes they've seen the smoke child somewhere in New England and wants to let me know that he's still out there, still afraid, still dangerous. I keep all the letters I get. Each one helps me remember Justin and Brett and Lena and even Danielle. I don't ever think I should stop. From the lecture room, he drove directly to the small town of Grafton, 80 miles east, arriving just before one in the morning. He parked the car at the top of Isinglass Mountain and, bracing himself against the cold, descended the path towards Ruggles Mine with a stranger's hand-drawn map to guide him. There, in the open ravine, he shone a flashlight around the aging rock formations, the crumbling arches, and the curious pockets. He stopped short of entering the tunnels. He stood just outside the mouth of one for almost an hour, watching and listening for signs of movement. But there were none. Finally, he drove back to his motel, and there he sat on the edge of the bed just before dawn, listening to one of his meditation tapes and imagining himself entering a church in summertime as neither man nor adolescent nor little boy, only a body released from time, finding calm in the ceaseless candlelight. Mm 